For our calculus project, we wanted to explore a new concept, which is approximating values on the imaginary plane. First, let's start off by reviewing the imaginary number and its properties. i equals the square root of negative 1, and i squared equals negative 1 because it's i times i. i cubed equals negative square root of negative 1 because it's negative i and i to the fourth power equals 1 because it's i squared times itself. And from then on, the pattern keeps going. From the above equation, we can see that i equals i to the power of 4n plus 1, where n is always a positive integer. The imaginary plane contains both real and imaginary numbers, where numbers on the x-axis are real numbers and numbers on the y-axis are imaginary numbers. In the point represented above 3 plus 4i, 3 is represented on the real axis and 4i is represented on the imaginary axis. Vector rotation in the imaginary plane. Since i equals the square root of negative 1, i squared equals negative 1. So for a vector 3 plus 4i in the imaginary plane, 3 plus 4i times i equals negative 4 plus 3i, which is the reversal of the original vector. This happens to be point B on the graph, and the original vector is point A. So multiplying something by i equals rotating the original vector by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So assume a vector a plus bi is multiplied by i, the vector will always be 90 degrees counterclockwise. This ends up as a shift from point A to point B. Our first question is, what is i times the quantity of 7t minus 8t squared i? The answer to this question is 8t squared plus 7it. Just like we showed in the example 3 plus 4i, when you multiply by i, the equation is reversed because it is rotated by 90 degrees. Also, the distributive property is used and both terms are multiplied by i. A negative number multiplied by i is negative i, and negative i times i is a positive real number. Our second question is, consider the following graph. What would a transformation of i squared look like? The answer to this question is the same graph but rotated 180 degrees. This is because previously we established that multiplying by i rotates every point 90 degrees counterclockwise relative to the origin. So i squared would be a rotation of 180 degrees. The problem, not all equations on the imaginary plane can be evaluated by plugging in numbers because only certain points are known. Consider the function e to the ix. It's not easy to compute because it is not possible to calculate e to the 2i or e to the 3i. What does the graph look like? For a scenario like this, we need a general approach to approximating imaginary functions. So let's start with approximating with derivatives in the real plane using Euler's method. Any function can be approximated with respect to inputs, a starting point and the derivative of the function. For example, let's use an example function x squared plus 1. Its derivative would be 2x. Using the starting point 1, 2, g of 2 can be approximated with a step size of 1, and using the tangent line approximation, we would get 4, which is not far off from g of 2 equals 5, which is the real value. Like what we have learned in Euler's method, larger step sizes have worse approximations. And as step sizes approach zero, the approximation approaches the curve. So if our step size was one half or one fourth, it would be a much better approximation than a step size of one. We now have two problems regarding Euler's method. The first one is approximate f of three using the function f of x equals x to the fourth power plus three starting from the point 0, 3, and using a step size of 1. Going through the Euler's method process, where you calculate the derivative and the tangent line, using it to approximate each step size, you would get the answer of 31, 
which is very far off from the real value of f of 3, which is 84. This is largely due to starting at an extrema, where f of 0 equals 0, and having a relatively high step size. Our second question is, approximate g of 4 using the function g of x equals x squared with two steps of size 1 and on the starting point 2, 5. Notice the starting point is not on the graph, but despite that, the estimation was 15, which is very close to the real g of 4 value of 16. This is because x squared is a less complicated function, and the starting point was not next to an extrema. This is a graphical representation of the concept, starting with the blue graph and working our way towards the red graph. The approximation works even if the chosen point is not on the curve and the smaller step size yields better approximation. As the step size approaches zero, the approximation becomes equivalent to taking the integral of the derivative over the given time. Now moving on to approximation in the imaginary plane. To approximate the function e to the ix, one starting point is needed. And there is only one point that can be calculated, and that is f of zero where e to the 0 power equals 1. Starting from there, the velocity of the movement is f prime of x, which is i times f of x, because the derivatives of e to the i x is i times e to the i x. This can be used to approximate given values of f of x with less error for smaller step sizes. We now have a question regarding approximation in the imaginary plane. Estimate the complex value at time 2 for f of t equals 3t squared plus 3i plus 2it for point 0 plus 3i at time 0 with a step size of 1. The derivative of f of t is 6t plus 2i. h of t will re represent the approximation for a given value of t. We start with f of 0, which is 0 plus 3i, given in the problem. h of 1 will equal 0 plus 3i plus 6 times 0 plus 2i, which will yield 0 plus 5i. This makes f prime of 1 to equal 6 plus 2i, and h of 2 to equal 6 plus 7i, which will be our final approximation. Because f of 2 equals 12 plus 7i, this is a fairly good approximation. However, a step size of 1 half gives 9 plus 7i, which is even better. Smaller step sizes will give better and better approximations as the step size approaches 0. Here is an example of approximating e to the ix on a random point. Using a step size of 1 where k of x is the approximation, another way to think of it is setting e to the ix equal to a, and where the derivative will be a of i. Using the same method, we find our following final approximation to be negative 2 plus 2i. How close are we? By writing the function y equals e to the ix as a Maclaurin series, we get 1 plus ix plus ix squared over 2 factorial plus ix cubed over 3 factorial and so on. And this ultimately gives us cosine x plus i times sine x after further simplification. This gives us a precise result to compare the estimation to. Comparing our approximated value to the actual value calculated using series, we get negative 0.98 plus 0.1411i, which is the red dot on the graph. With a step size of 1, the approximation for this point is very far off. Negative 2 minus 2i, which is the point that we got in the previous slide. That is the blue point on this graph. With a step size of 1 half, however, we get negative 2.4, 0.75, which is the green point, which is far closer than the approximation we got on the previous slide. But what is the shape of e to the ix? As the step size becomes smaller and smaller, there's less spiraling, and because the step size is approaching zero, each position point to the same distance away from the origin becomes like a circle, 
with the tangent approximation becoming like a rotation. Put in another way, it acts just like an orbit, where a con constantly changing velocity tangent to its position vector means that the distance from the origin remains constant. So the final shape of e to the ix is actually a circle plotted on the real and imaginary axes. As the step size approaches zero, the approximation approaches the real graph with zero error. Therefore, x is the distance along the graph, and the graph for a given x, the point chosen is complex value for e to the ix. The displacement from the starting point is the value of e to the ix, where x is distance traveled along the function. Some points on this graph include e to the i pi, which equals negative 1, and e to the i 2 pi, which equals 0, as shown in the graph above. Our conclusion is that approximations can be very frustrating, especially using imaginary numbers and Euler's method, but at the same time, they are very flexible. Across math, approximations can be used almost anywhere a derivative can be found.